Hello and welcome once again to the Yellow Jacket Experience. Your host, Seth Dussault, the voice of the Yellow Jackets here. This is a very special edition in conjunction with the Northeast 10 Conference's 40th anniversary, celebrating great individuals and great teams in the history of the NE10. We have some members of our 2006 National Finalist Women's Basketball Team, players, coaches. Uh, first of all, let's go around the video and everybody can introduce themselves. It'd be the easiest way for people to know what's going on here. Okay, I'll start. I'm uh, Pete Sanella. I was the head coach uh, of the 2006 team. I'm currently now an assistant coach at Seton Hall University. Uh, Kristen Hutchison, I was the assistant coach on the 06 team and now I'm the head women's basketball coach at AIC. All right, um, I'm Jennifer Nana. I was a center on the team and now I am a business development manager and a parent. There you Shut go. So. Lots of, lots of different things, although lots of basketball still, of course. And I want to actually go back even before 2005-06 started. I want to go all the way back to 2002, uh, Kristen, Pete. Obviously, that was kind of the first big foray for the Yellow Jackets women's basketball program onto the national stage, reaching the Elite Eight, obviously losing a heartbreaker. It was double overtime, if I'm remembering right. What did both of you learn from that? Um, and how did it shape – how you tried to build the team over the next few years, recruiting players like Jen and just the approach that you had going into. Well, yeah, you're, you're very correct about that, Seth. The 2002 team led by, by Kristen and, and Rona McKenzie, um, that set the whole stage for the 2016, because you also got to remember, we had three players that ended up being seniors on the 2016, Charmian Selman, Debbie Sampson and Tiffany Wooten, they were on that 2002 team as redshirt freshmen. So they practiced every day. And, and Kristen was the captain, and she really oh, led that team, as well as with Rona, to a 28-4 record. They, they won the regular season and the, also the Northeast 10 playoffs and then got us to the Elite Eight. So I think that really – that way, what, that set the stage for, like, all right, we're, we're not just trying to make the NCAA tournament. We're trying to – get to the final four we're trying to get to the national championship game and that team really set that all up and coach from your perspective as a as a player how did you then kind of take that into become when you became a coach well i think we just got to taste the national scene and then we just wanted to keep getting there um and then you know we just kept getting better since oh two like our teams we had really good teams and 03, we kind of took a year off, but then 04, we were really good. 05, we were really good. And, oh, you know, obviously 06. So we, we didn't make it as far those years, um, but we had really, really good teams. Yeah, Seth, I remember that. The 05 team started off 16-1, and one, and then our starting center, Linda Pierre, tore her ACL. So I think that was really a good – that team really might have had a chance to be a Final Four team because we had Jen Nana as a freshman at 6'3", leading the league in blocks, and Linda Pierre as a senior was top five in blocks. So those two kind of tag team. But when Linda got hurt, that, that set, it, set us back a little bit, and we ended up, you know, with 23 wins. But, you know, certainly 16-1 and one was, you know, a, a great start. So, Jen, talk about then coming in to a group that's, you know, you've got some established players, a, a presence, kind of what – what attracted you to wanting to come to AIC and what do you feel like you could contribute to a, to a team like that as a younger player getting into that? Honestly, um, the thing that attracted me the most about AIC was the coaching staff. They were very persistent. Um, I received personal letters, you know, like just personal, personalized letters to my house and it just sparked some interest on the school itself because I, I had no clue um, where Springfield, Massachusetts was being from New Jersey. So the coaching staff definitely sparked my interest to come to AIC. And then it was just exciting. You know, there's, we had veterans on the team. So I was, I was pretty much one of the youngest players, but I had a good amount of direction. There's always seemingly a moment in a great season where you kind of get that, that first kind of spark of this could be something special. Now, you guys knew you were going to be pretty good, obviously, from what you were saying, Pete. 
But was there a moment early on in that 05, 06 season where you thought, wow, we really can do this? You know, I do believe that. It was probably in the second game. Charmian Selman, who was, you know, one of the greatest AIC players, one of the, you know, probably one of the greatest Northeast 10 players of all time, scored under 2,000 points, uh, almost 2,000, 1,000 rebounds. So she broke her finger the very first practice of the season. And so she missed all those early practices. And then she missed the first game. But every single day she would run on the side as we were practicing, she was running. So she stayed in great shape. And then she was cleared for the second game of the year. I think we played Bloomfield, not a conference game. And the game started and Charm was just like possessed. And she hit like three turnarounds <laughs> right away. And the score was like 10 to nothing right away. And the whole team was like, yeah, we got Charm. We're going to win almost every game. And we started off 11 and 0. So I think that moment of Charm broke her thumb, hasn't practiced one time. And then she gets cleared, and two days later, she's out there dominating. I think that really set the stage, right? Charm is going to – you know, we have a very good team, and, and, but we also have an All-American that can, we can throw the ball to, and she can get us a basket anytime we need one. So you guys start the season 11-0, and which is an absolutely ridiculous run to go on. Um, believe that's the, uh, the longest winning streak to start a season in – in AIC women's basketball history might be for any team at AIC. Uh, what, what kind of predicated that run? What was, what was working? I mean, obviously you have great players and that's a start, but it takes more than just talent to win 11 straight, especially in the any 10, which is so tough. Kristen, you want to answer that to start? Um, yeah, I'll answer it. I just, we were just very well prepared. We knew our opponents very well. Like I said, we had Charm, Debbie, and Tiff, who were all on the team for five years. They're playing against this, the same opponents, same coaches. Um, we had a good game plan coming in. And someone we haven't talked about was uh, Crystal Presley joined the team that year. Um, and she could really shoot it. Uh, <laughs> and we shot the ball really well early on in the season. And so that obviously – opened up the inside for Charm um, to score some easy baskets. So we, we just did a good job scouting. We just – we were playing really, really, really well early in the season. Seth, I think the 2006 team, and, and I believe, you know, Kristen and Jen can also attest to this, we were so athletic and so big. Tiffany Wooten was a six-foot-one uh, three-man. She was our starting center her first two years, then we moved her to three. Alyssa Rabino and Jeanette Jonathan were very big point guards, 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, so we had probably the highest level of athleticism and size in, in the conference. So that's, that was a key part of us getting. And we did that to really – there were some really good teams in the league during that time, Stonehill, Bentley, and a, and a great Southern Connecticut team that would win the national championship. So we tried to match you know, them up with more athleticism and size. And we uh... – or number one in the conference for field goal percentage defense that year, too. Now, you, know, just... Jen, you know, Seth, we started off that year 11 and 0. Uh, and just to tell you how unique of a player Jen Nan is, the, the reason we lost a couple games right after that 11 0 start was Jen got mono. And she was our backup center, but she was one of the most game changing players I've ever seen because she would block any shot inside of 15 feet so when she got mono and missed a good month you know we lost a few games close games and we lost a couple of games we probably shouldn't have and I think that was the key is you know when Jen came back that's when we were able to make that you know NCAA tournament run yeah which, which kind of leads into into what I was uh, going to bring up uh, you play you brought up how good Stonehill was um, Southern Connecticut Bentley um, you run into Stonehill, and if I'm remembering right, both teams are 11 and 0, which is, yes. which is absolutely like wild to think not only one team to do it, but two. Um, what was that that game like? And, and obviously, we didn't we didn't come out on the right side of it. But what did we take from that that helped us ultimately? We beat them in the NCAA. So, right. you know, what did we learn from that loss? Was that the game Jen had 12 blocks? No, no, that, that, yeah, I think Jen, that was, she was sick that game oh. against Stonehill, but she did, she did have, a, she had, uh, 
I think she had 14 blocks in, in a game. But, you know, <laughs> Stonehill was a very good team, but the girls on our team, a lot of them were from that area, Tiffany, Tiffany and Debbie. They believed they were going to beat Stonehill. I think we had beaten Stonehill 15 out of 16 times going to that game. So we knew it was a big game, but we also really felt we were going to win. But they did. They, they pulled it out and beat us by two points. And then we came back and beat them in a very close game at home, I also believe, by two points. But then we beat that team in the NCAA tournament by 20, 25 points. It's sort of amazing to think of that. Like, you know, and Jen, you can maybe maybe speak to this as somebody who was on the court for at least some of it, to play to be in two-point games and then to play a team a third time and blow them out. What has to change as a player to have that much more success when you're – when you're playing the same team that you've seen three times? Honestly, it's, I think it was more so we were just really pumped. We were super excited. Um, we just didn't want to lose. We played to, I would say we played to win and not to lose. We came out hard and there was more of an intimidation factor. We knew, we knew we were a better team. So we said, you know what, let's do it. We were pumped up. We were just ready to go. We were super excited and we just came ready to, we came ready to play. Now, there's, there's another team I want to bring in that because we've mentioned Stonehill. You've mentioned Southern Connecticut. We'll talk about them in a minute. St. Rose. I don't think you can talk about 2005-06 uh, without talking about St. Rose. And I can yeah. see the look on Jen's face right now because she knows exactly where this is going. Any 10 tournament, first round, and heartbreak. Buzzer yep. beater, mm -hmm. kind of unbelievable to lose to that team. And then you draw them in the first round of the NCAAs. Yeah. How much was – let's get some revenge a factor in winning that game, and how much was it just the result that it should have been probably in the, in the any 10 tournament game? Well, St. Rose – and our league that year was very good. Six teams made the NCAA tournament. I think all the coaches in the Northeast 10 that year felt that whoever won the conference was really going to have a chance to win the national championship. And we felt that same way. So then when we came in third place in the regular season, and but we were also the only team, you know, to, to, to beat Southern Connecticut more than once. And we played St. Rose in that first round. They were very good. But Crystal Presley hit a layup with just a few seconds left to give us a one-point lead. And then a girl, I don't recall her name, but I, she was a hardworking player, hit about an 18-foot pull-up, and she was not a shooter. And I think it was her only field goal that she had made that game. And that was right at the buzzer. So that really – to lose in the first round of your conference playoffs after having really a, a team as good as we were, that was devastating. And I'll give the team credit. They worked very, very hard the nine days between that and the NCAA tournament. And then when we got St. Rose, we knew we were going to win the game. We wanted to not – have the game come down to a last second shot we wanted to blow them out and we played an incredible first half and we're only up one because they st rose played well too but we just kept going and we ended up winning i, I think st rose banked in a three at the buzzer and we ended up winning the game by 17 so we were really up 20 much of the second half so we were ready for the ncaa tournament and, and not just to win a game but we were ready to win a few games that's i think stacy's on too I don't know. Yeah, if you... Okay. I was gonna say we have a fifth person here, but there's no video and no audio. Oh, she said can she was. Right? I can hear you. Yes. <laughs> hey, we, we hear you, Stacy. <laughs> okay. We can't see you, but we can hear you. All right, hold on. I'm at. <laughs> I'm at work, so I, I can't. I, I'm only kind of listening to you guys. I can't be too active of a participant. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fair. <laughs> oh, there we go. Hello. So. But I'm loving listening to this. Hey, Stacey. Good. Good, to, good to see you again. Oh, my goodness. Good to see you guys, too. It's awesome. Hey, Stacey, can you, still, can you still take three charges in a game if we put you in right now? Coach, I absolutely can. Hey, Jen. Yep. Hey, Stacy. It's funny. I actually play all this. The, some of the sergeants and the deputies here, they, they uh, challenge me to play horse. And I'm like, do you guys know I'm going to beat you? And every time they think, oh, I got this girl, go play. And. I win. <laughs> I'm sure you'll destroy them. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's probably not very fair to them. So you mentioned uh, coach, just getting back to this nine days between 
the any 10 loss in the first NCAA tournament game. Is that almost a benefit in a way to have that much time to kind of to practice, to regather, to refocus as opposed to competing as hard as to compete for a conference championship and then have to go into the national tournament? Is it maybe you have that opportunity to get healthy as well? Is that a big factor in what allowed us to have that success coming uh, into the NCAAs? No so, doubt about it. We, that, uh, during that time, Jen Nana got her win back after the mono had, had hurt her last month of the season, and she only played a few games at the end. She got in a rhythm there, and the whole team got healthy. And we did we, – we were a little tired at the end of the season. So we tweaked what we did going to the NCAA tournament, and we stopped pressing. We changed from pressing 40 minutes a game to we're just going to press selectively and focused on our half-court defense. And that might have threw a few of the teams off early in the NCAA because they were used to us pressing the full game. And we kind of just fo focused on half-court defense. And we were, we were a defensive team. We were a defensive team. We were a rebounding team. And that just we, – we locked in in our half-court D. And, you know, the, the, the scores of the games were very low scoring in the, um, you know, regional championships. And I just wanted to throw in that when we lost that game to St. Rose, um, the team was was mad. Um, coach was mad. We were mad. Um, the team was extremely mad. And I think we all just used that as motivation because we couldn't believe how well we, you know, we were a great team and we lost that game. And then our season could be over and we have all this talent. So we really came together. Um, and I think it was that's what motivated us because everybody was so mad after that loss. That really makes sense. I've been around here long enough to have experienced a few of those kind of losses with uh, different teams. And it's, it's even worse, it feels like, when you lose to a team that you should beat, no, you feel like you should beat no problem. Southern Connecticut's a team that's been brought up. Uh, they were – the number one team in the NE10. I think they won the tournament that year, the conference. Um, they only lost four games all year. Three of them were to us, including the regional championship game. What was it? The, how did we have their number? I mean, it's, that was the team that was number one in the country defensively. Um, what, what was it about our team that just we were able to give them fits and beat them? Good question. Joe Frager, uh, now the head coach of Fairfield, would win the national championship the following year. And you know what? Southern Connecticut, they might have won the national championship that year as well. But we were just a good matchup for them, and we believed we were going to beat them. They, they had certain players at certain positions, and we could defend them with our size. I, I do believe that Jen was a major part of that because in all three of our – uh, I, I think Jen missed one of the games, but in the two times we'd beaten them three times, we got the lead. And once we got the lead, we went zone, put Jen in the middle, and she really intimidated um, a very good Southern Connecticut team, and they couldn't get any shots inside of 10 or 15 feet. The other thing is they had a great player who would be the Northeast 10 player of the year the following year in Kate Lynch, but Charm was that good. And, and mm -hmm. Charm – was able to out, you know, outplay Kate Lynch, and, and Kate would probably admit this, and she's a great player, but Charm was was a really, really good player, and Char Charm in some of the in that NCAA tournament game, which we won forty eight to forty, Charm just willed herself on these wild drives, and she, just nobody could stop her, and it was, I think we were down uh, four or five points midway through the second half, and and Charm just grabbed the rebound and went coast to coast three consecutive times to give us the lead and we never lost that lead. Yeah. What for Jen and for Stacy as well, what's it like playing with, with somebody, you know, especially you were younger players at the time. Um, what's it like playing with somebody like that who can take over a game? What did you guys learn from that experience of playing with a player like that? What? It was exciting. Every game was literally was exciting. Um, you know, I wasn't that much of an offensive player, but I knew that if my if one of my players, you know, I always had their back. That's that was the one thing that I would always, you know, have in the back of my head. If someone needs me, I have to step up and I have to have their back. But playing with a player like Charm was literally exciting. You know, we would see certain things she would do on the court and she just had this look in her eye when she was going to the basket. She was going to the basket. She was going all the way. She's not going to stop. 
and we knew that about her so I would just say it was just it was it was like an adrenaline rush it was really exciting to play with a player like her yeah I agree um Charm Tiff and Carmen they were like the three seniors the three captains that we always looked up to and I mean um having Charm be my kind of role model as a freshman and she was a senior just kind of set the tone for my next three years, just being like, this is who I looked up to when I was starting out my college career. This is who I want to kind of emulate her hard work. She'd always be a practice early, shooting around, working on her moves. And um, she just, like, like Jen said, playing with her, she was unstoppable. And you knew going into every game that you had her, that a team was jumped on her back and she was just taking us, you know? So you win the regional, 48 to 40, as, as Coach Pete said, uh, which is really low scoring basketball game. And you go into the, the national quarterfinals and, and the national semifinal too, obviously, as we get there and play against the number three and the number four offense in Division II those year, that year. Um, how did uh, the way we play or the way we prepared for that change going from playing against teams that played really good defense to teams that relied on their offense, because obviously, you know, that's a completely different style of basketball and maybe something that you hadn't seen, you know, certainly an opponent you hadn't seen before. That's a good question. You know, different styles of play in different parts of the country. So we, the Northeast 10, particularly during that time period was more gritty defensive minded, tough basketball and they played probably more open styles say in the Midwest where we played Emporia State and St. Cloud State so we but we were able to play, like we could we could run and we could score points but you know our our, our main thing we did was defend and rebound but we kind of went into that tournament thinking we that we're from the Northeast 10 you know six teams made the NCAAs and we're going to be the best team out here that's what we went out there and thought and then when Debbie Sampson and myself and Charmian Selman we're at the press conference the day before the game. They were like, how are you guys even here? You came in third place in their conference. Like you lost um, seven games. How are you, you know, everybody else out there was 30 and two or 28 and one. And we were like, we went out there thinking we were the best team. And the, the reporters, there was about 10 of them at the press conference from Emporia State, different places in Kansas were like, you guys are underdogs. And we didn't think that at all. So that, that got us really mad and motivated that well, you know we're 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 from the northeast part of the country we we, we think we're the, playing the best basketball and and then we went out there with that chip on our shoulder for the whole tournament i kind of want to one of the things that's noticeable looking at the box score coach hutchison pointed this out to me you gave up 40 points to southern connecticut the whole the whole team in the regional championship game and Emporia State had a player drop 40 on you by herself. So what was, what was the – and we obviously scored a lot more. We scored, I think, 83 in that game, if I'm remembering right. So – 86, yeah. Yes, yeah, Was it just, you know, okay, we're going we're gonna to go shot for shot with you then? Or, or kind of what, what happened to make that game end up the way it did? Well, you know, in, in, there was a moment in that game about midway through the second half in which – and I'll tell you, Jen – you know, Nana and, and Stacey are both very great players, but Jen Nana could change an entire game. And in that game, she had six blocks. She was our backup center. She only played about 18 minutes a game because, she, you know, of her knee, knee, she had some knee pain and she had mono that year. But she was, a, she was the best shot blocker in the country. There's no doubt about that. And when that girl came down on a three-on-two and Jen was back on D, and Jen would be back on D a lot, she just kicked the ball out of bounds because she had already had her shot blocked by Jen three or four times. So I know that girl had 40, but we took uh, Charm and got in the zone and, and scored 26 points, mostly in the second half. And we had about a 15 point lead. And, you know, she scored a lot of those baskets late as they were kind of cutting it to, to 10 or, or you know, they never really cut it below much below that till the very end. So I, I think, you know, she was a great player. She was a borderline WNBA player, six, two, I, I, you know, it's amazing uh, of, of a good player she was, but we, we were able to intimidate her at that 10 minute mark, just based on Jen's incredible, you know, six foot three 
but a wingspan of, of 6'10 and an, an ability to just really have a high vertical leap and block every shot um, inside of 15 feet. I think in that game too, Seth, everybody um, scored. Everybody on our roster scored. Um, and that was probably, I, I think, our best game of the whole season uh, versus Emporia State. So if someone came in and they did their job, they got one open shot, they made it. Um, if, it if we needed a defensive stop, someone came in and, and, and did their job. And it was a whole team effort. Obviously, we were led by Charmian, but um, our bench did a great job. And it, it really was like one of our best games of the whole year. So you guys beat Emporia, you beat St. Cloud. Um, did, you, did you have enough time to like really let have it hit you? Oh my gosh, we're playing for a national championship. Like what was the emotion like going into that, that championship game? And how maybe do you- Coach, Coach Pete would go for walks every morning. We're in Hot <laughs> Springs, Arkansas. And he'd yeah. walk up the mountain, he'd have 10 cups of coffee and he'd be like, Kristen, you ready to go? It's time to- do the scouting report and he would just walk around we had we were just running on fumes at that point the adrenaline rush of winning a game as a coach or a player is incredible but when you're at that you know you're there's only four teams left and you win a final four game the adrenaline rush is incredible so we were just you know working pretty much all night on the scouting reports making sure the players got some rest it was just a weird feeling in the elite eight you go there and there's eight teams and all the fans are, you know, in the same lobby of the hotel. And then by the time you know, there's only two teams left, the hotel was kind of empty except for your fans and their fans. And so we were just, we, we did have a day off in between, which allowed us to regroup a little bit and tr prepare for that national championship game. But just the adrenaline rush, got you know everybody very motivated for that and very excited you know the the it's just such a you know now we're one of the final two teams and here we are on espn uh you know saturday night you know you know everybody's going to watch the game and and we were excited for that what, what what about for you guys as players what was that that moment like and and putting yourselves and your school on on the biggest stage that's possible that's that's honestly what I was thinking about. I was like, I'm gonna be on TV. I was, <laughs> I was so happy about it because my parents didn't really get to come to um, a lot of the games and um, my family and my friends. And it's the main thing I was thinking was, wow, we made it. We we're gonna be on ESPN, you know. So that's what had me motivated. I was super hyped for that. Oh yeah, same thing. I mean. I was a freshman, so that was, oh my gosh, my first college season and then going on and we just kept winning. I mean, obviously we talked about some of our, our Northeast 10 championship game, but it was, we just kept winning. And, I, you know, it was like when we were, when we were there in Hot, Hot Springs, Arkansas, I mean, it was a trip. It was the first time I'd really traveled that much for, for a tournament or anything like that. And then knowing that, yeah, we were going to be on ESPN too, which is butterflies starting from the get-go. And I remember the cameraman was, when Charmian was warming up and stretching, he was like, just taking solos. <laughs> and I'm like, this is it. This is what it feels like. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was a great experience. So let's go beyond the play-by-play -play of the season a little bit. Cause you know, I mean, anybody can do what I did and look at box scores or you know, go through the, the stats and see what happened. But there's so much more to a team than, than the, the raw numbers. What moments stand out um, to you guys from that season? And it can be off the court stuff too. It doesn't necessarily have to be a moment in a game. Obviously, we'll keep it family friendly because, you know, the little one's running around. But, but like, what are, what are some things that you remember maybe that have nothing to do, even nothing to do with basketball uh, from that season? If I could start, and then I'll let the girls take over. But uh, I, one thing I, I thought, we, we really did have a good group of girls. I mean, I, I remember this. Debbie Sampson was an all-conference player as a junior coming off the bench, and she made all-conference second team. And then we decided to, um, you know, have her come off the bench again as a senior. She was a great player. She averaged double figures off the bench, and she accepted that role. And that was, you know, the type of players we had. Uh, if there's one other thing I do remember, I, I was just thinking about this. 
the day before the national championship game, I went down to the computer uh, business center and Jen was on one of the computers looking <laughs> at the pictures from the Springfield newspaper. And I go, well, how'd you get that? And she was like, this thing, Facebook. And that was the first time I'd seen Jen. You were on Facebook like way before anybody else was. Oh, I remember that. that. That's actually kind of amazing. He's a pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to piggyback off of that. Honestly, um, I feel like our team was just really tight. We were literally friends on and off the court. If we needed advice, um, someone was literally there, literally the, every step of the way. Like if, if it was a confrontation or just to diffuse a situation or someone was feeling down about anything, if it was your home life, we literally had, we, 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 were, we were more so family and we became like, we were friends, but we became like a really tight family. Everybody knew that the basketball team literally hung together. So that's one of the things that I will remember for the rest of my life about the AIC basketball team. We were really tight and a lot of us are still really tight. Um, but it was a lot of good, good relationships formed there. We're more so family. Yeah, I agree with Jen. I mean, I remember, obviously you'll remember the games. You don't, I don't remember our record and you remember, you remember the final four and the national championship mm -hmm. game and the feel, all the feelings that came with that. But like like Jen said, I mean, it's the the relationships we had. We hung out all the time on the court, off the court. We were all roommates. We all ate together at the same table. It was like it was a brotherhood. And and those it's true. That's what I remember the most, and that's what I take away from it the most. Obviously, basketball was our number one priority, and education, of course, up to. Um, but yeah, it was the relationships with each other, and that was mm -hmm. made practice fun every day. Even if I just remember, and I'll talk a little bit about basketball, but I just remember the practices. Um, you know, they were so intense. So here's Stacy as a senior, she's an All American. She's going against Charmian every day in practice, and Charmian's an All American. Um, you know, Debbie Sampson's an All Conference player. She's going against um, Crystal Presley, who was first team all conference. So c the practices that year were so intense. And like mm -hmm. Jen and Stacy say, off the court, you know, they got along great. And during practice, you wanted to win, you know, mm -hmm. knocking someone down, getting an and one, screaming, and then we'd go to the locker room and everybody would be hugging and hanging out. So they were on a mission. We had great seniors that year. We had great captains. And, and we really, it started in practice. You could see it. They were on a mission. I want to add to that too. Our coaching staff is one of the main reasons I can say I, I was, you know, the person I am because they pay attention. You guys paid attention to detail, Coach Patterson and Coach Sanella. And I was more of a troubled teen and I had a little bit of, you know, um, my focus was a little off, but they didn't let you fall behind the cracks, literally. I would get a phone call, I had an eight o'clock class and um, I knew I had to be at this class. And I was kind of like, oh man, I'm gonna get a phone call from coach if I, you know. So I was literally staying on task because of them and practice. Coach Patterson was a threat in practice. You never have a coach that is literally beating players in practice. So when, when the coach is sitting there and it's super competitive, you kind of feel bad about it because it's like, this is my coach and my coach is doing better than me. So it caused a lot of people to pick it up because it's like, we're literally doing this every day and she's a coach and she's coming here and she's, she's busting our butts in practice. No, you got to pick it up. But it's definitely the coaching staff. Thank you, Jen. I, I, hey, I remember your first practice when you were a freshman, Jen. I go, Kristen, where is Jen? Go over, and, and Coach Kristen goes over to the dorms and looks for Jen, and there's no Jen. And we're sitting there. We're supposed to have weightlifting, and Jen still wasn't there. This is the first practice of the year, September 3rd or 4th. And then finally, the coach of Springfield College gives me a call and says, Coach, one of your players is here in the gym looking for practice. Jen, as a freshman, didn't know how to get to the gym. And she walked to the nearest gym, which is Springfield College's gym. So she was actually on the Springfield. She saw the dome. She thought it looked like, uh, you know, the Batova Gymnasium. So that's the way she started walking. She ended up making a practice a couple hours late. She wasn't late anymore after that. 
she wasn't late after that. That's wow. That that's that's incredible. Well, she also dunked a volleyball her first practice too. She did, yeah. Dunked a volleyball. I was there dunked a volleyball. <laughs> Uh, I agree, though. It, it's true. I mean, yeah, you can have an amazing group of student athletes and, and players and friends, but, and I had seen this in years past on teams and other conferences that we would play, but if the coaching staff isn't, isn't in line and working with you guys, no, they don't have to be buddy-buddy. No, they don't have to always agree. That wouldn't, that wouldn't work, but the way they kind of held us together also, but challenged us so much, it, it that's what makes a good team work. They both need to function together. And I think that season and, and really showed that it did. So one thing that's, that I like to look at with teams is, is the superstitious stuff, the way that they, you know, pregame or practice rituals. Um, I think of our women's soccer team, Coach Issa, if I'm there, will not, if we're on the road, won't give the starting lineup to the home team. He gives it to me to give to them, just to, like he sincerely believes we'll lose if he gives it directly to them. So what kind of rituals or superstitions or team building things did you guys have and kind of where did maybe did some of them come from? Yeah, I'll give you a couple things that yeah, you can think about it. I remember we, we did a, a nice ropes course in the woods uh, before the season and you know uh, my back uh, kind of went out for about three days after that but oh boy. Uh, the girls had a good time with that the other thing is coach Kristen and our other assistant coach Steve Marcel would yell to me during the game serenity now serenity now <laughs> which was from a Seinfeld episode where you know I guess if you yell that it's supposed to keep you calm but it worked most of the season. But as the season wore on, I would just turn and start, you know, yelling, you know, screw serenity and stop, you know. But we, we, they, they, would, they would just yell at me or, or pull me by my belt back onto the bench so I wouldn't get a technical. <laughs> I would say for us, um, just our warm-ups, we had, like, we had to have, like, good songs to come out to we had like a certain order is how we would run out on the court and um it literally was just our warm-up we would we would have a specific warm-up that routine that we would do every single time we stepped on the court from the locker room from the locker room till we got upstairs to stepping on the court Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, re I remember that walking out, people would touch different parts of the door, um, they would certain it, certain players would do a certain handshake, and they had to do it before every game. I mean, me personally, I wouldn't wash my socks if I won. I'm sure other people had their own things too, but <laughs> yeah, that's mostly what I can think of is our warm-up. Mm -hmm really amazing like what people people will do and 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 think about and um so now looking back kind of on on all of it because it's been you know this is 50 this will be 15 years which is really really unbelievable um, what sort of things did you get from that that run that whole season that even now you kind of take maybe a moment and think and go Oh wow! This is this is something that goes back to to when we went to the national championship game that season. Well, I'll start off. You know, it's just a great group of you know real winners and leaders. And I know they probably think about that season and that game, and I, I think they probably have this confidence that they go through in life, whether you know it was our point guard, uh, Liz Rubino, our captains, our seniors the different players we had on our team were such good teammates and role players that bought into whatever the job was. It was just a really good group of girls. And I think, you know, that confident feel that they have to be in such good teammates and a good team has probably carried with them, you know, into their own lives and their own families. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's something like we, we did something great. I mean, not a lot of people can say they've done, they've done that. When I talk to people that I work with, you know, because I meet new people all the time, it's always, wow, you did what? I, you played, oh, you played in college? Oh, you, it's, it's really cool to see. And 
um, like I was showing people my old school on online the other day, and it's it's something really special that I know that we accomplished together, and it's you'll always look back on it, especially not being in the basketball world anymore, to say that we're on ESPN two, we we went to the national championship. I mean, we gave it our all. It's it's something, yeah, cool to brag about that. Yeah, always instill that type of confidence in. We were the smallest school in Division two. And we made it to the, you know, national championship game and uh, the national finals. And, uh, you know, now I'm in the Big East. And I, I tell you, that team would beat many teams in Division One, many teams in the Big East. That was just a great group of, of girls that played hard, you know, very competitive, very competitive team. Well, th thank you guys for all for coming on. Uh, it's great to, you know, not only to give you guys a chance to reminisce about this, but to, to learn about, again, what is arguably one of, one of, if not the greatest team, not only in the history of AIC women's basketball, but just the athletic program here at AIC in general, which you know, obviously we have a lot of storied teams, but only, only three national finals appearances in the entire history of the school. Um, you guys were the first ones to do it. So thank you again for coming on. Um,